Today we heard the story of the golden calf. Moses was on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments, and because the Israelites feared that Moses was dead, they made a golden calf to worship in place of God. God wanted to destroy the whole people because of this, but Moses talked him out of it. Then Moses presented the Ten Commandments to the people, as well as hundreds of smaller other laws that would govern their interactions with one another and with God. Through the rest of their 40 years in the wilderness, the Israelites slowly learned to trust and rely on the God who had freed them from slavery in Egypt. Eventually, they came to the land that God had promised to Abraham and Sarah generations before. The new generation of Israelites crossed the Jordan River into the Promised Land and began battling the nations who lived there so that they could possess the land as God willed. They were led by military leaders and prophets called judges. Over many years, the judges, both men and women, helped the Israelites to defeat many nations and to settle the land. Today's story is the story of an Israelite woman named Hannah who desperately wanted a son. While her husband's second wife bore him many children, Hannah remained childless and devastated. After years of barrenness, Hannah goes to the temple to plead with God for a son, and she promises to dedicate him to God to serve as a prophet. A reading from 1 Samuel. <clears throat> After they had eaten and drunk at Shiloh, Hannah rose and presented herself before the Lord. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She made this vow. O Lord of hosts, if only you will look on the misery of your servant and remember me, and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a male child, then I will set him before you as a Nazarite until the day of his death. He shall drink neither wine nor intoxicants, and no razor shall touch his head. They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah. Elkanah knew his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. In due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. She named him Samuel, for she said, I have asked him of the Lord. Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord, my strength is exalted in my God. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in my victory. There is no one like the Lord, no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bird on strength. Those who are full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who are hungry are fat with spoil. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low. He also exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might does one prevail. The Lord, his adversary shall be shattered. The Most High will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the power of his anointed. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As you've read the Bible, have you ever wondered why certain stories were included and others weren't? Why all the books about wars and battles and massacres in a book that we use to shape our lives around love and mercy? Why do we hear two different ways that Judas supposedly died when we never hear how or when Mary's husband Joseph died? Why do we need to hear about Jesus cursing a fig tree when we hear almost nothing about the first 30 years of his life. It's weird, isn't it? 
When you're writing books, you can't include everything, but why include some random details and not other things that seem crucial? Well, some of the things that are included have to do with the historical context they were writing for. While we see little or no use to the dozens of chapters of obscure laws in the first five books of the Bible, they help to shape the lives of the Israelites in the wilderness and the Promised Land. Making animal sacrifices to God was a huge part of Hebrew culture, where now in our culture it's unheard of. Foot washing isn't really a thing in our culture, but it was a big deal in biblical times. Also different is the fact that women weren't seen as particularly significant in Bible times, so stories of women are pretty rare in the Bible. But when women do have major roles in the biblical story, it's usually a good time to pay attention and wonder what God is doing through them and through their stories. <clears throat> Hannah wasn't anyone special. In fact, these are the only two chapters in the whole Bible that even mention her. But 1 Samuel begins with Hannah's story, a story that should sound a little familiar because it echoes stories of other women in the Bible. There's a woman, a wife, who's adored by her husband, but much like Sarah and Rachel's stories, Hannah had no children. Also much like Sarah and Rachel, Hannah felt humiliated and mocked by the fertility of her husband's other wife while she remained barren and devastated. Women couldn't earn a living. They couldn't fight in battle. They couldn't own their own property. They couldn't even live independently. The one valuable thing they could do was bear children. So imagine the grief and shame of these women who remained childless for years. What value did they have without sons? Hannah's sweet husband tried to convince her that she was valuable without children, to no avail. Okay, we've heard this storyline before, at least twice so far in the Bible. Why do we need to hear about another poor woman struggling with being childless? Because this woman was different. While Sarah and Rachel dreamt of watching their sons grow up and being cared for by their sons in their old age, Hannah had a different dream. She dreamed of bearing a son who she could dedicate to God, basically giving up the son that she longed for to be raised by the priests so he could become a servant of God. Think about that. Wanting something more than anything else in the world, and when finally getting it, giving it away. Now, when we want something deeply and pray to God, it's not uncommon to make God promises about what we will do when we get it. When Martin Luther was stranded in a horrible thunderstorm, he promised to become a monk if God protected him. I've always been a little surprised that he followed through with that promise because most of us have bargained with God and not followed through on our side of the bargain when we got what we asked for. And really, nobody would have hold, held Hannah to her promise to give up the child that she had prayed so long to receive. Yet when Hannah was given a son and named him Samuel, she honored that promise to dedicate him in service to God. <clears throat> After she weaned him, that's exactly what she did. She took her son to the prophet Eli, to the priest Eli, and Samuel was raised by the priests. Hannah got to see Samuel just once a year. But what an incredible sacrifice she made, giving her son to serve the God who had given him to her. Can you imagine that? Hannah had an understanding that children belonged to God more than to us. And she was determined to share her son so that he could fulfill his purpose, which he couldn't do if she simply raised him on her own. And in fact, Samuel became a great prophet and an essential leader for God's people. As Hannah left her young son with the priests, she sang a song to the God who she was giving her son to. 
Must have been a teary song of loss and lament, right? No. Hannah's song isn't the song of a fragile woman grieving the loss of her son. Hannah's song is an anthem to strength and faith, an anthem sung about God's power and ability to right the wrongs of the world. She sings, There is no holy one like the Lord, no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap. From the pillars of the earth, the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness, for not by might does one prevail. The Lord, his adversary, shall be shattered. The Most High will thunder in heaven. We often picture biblical women as serene, meek, and mild. Women who quietly care for children while men make the real difference. Hannah's short story paints a totally different picture of the biblical woman. This woman is anything but meek and fragile, a passive damsel in distress. Hannah has the courage and the commitment to give her son to God, not just hoping, but expecting and demanding that God do great and mighty things for his people through him. And God does just that. Hannah's song sounds very much like the song of another mother whose son is given to do great and mighty things. After the angel Gabriel comes to Mary and tells her she's going to bear a son and name him Jesus, she also sings a song. And this song isn't any more of a sweet lullaby or a meek melody than Hannah's song is. Mary's song, the Magnificat, is an anthem about God's power and might. In fact, Mary's song is a song of revolution, remembering God's power and calling God to use her son to change the world. God has shown strength with his arm, she sings. He has scattered the proud in their hearts, brought down the powerful, powerful from their thrones, lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. We'll sing a version of the Magnificat at the end of the service today. So just notice how this sweet mother mild calls for God to turn the world upside down. And through her son, God does exactly that. These women aren't fragile, helpless, voiceless mothers of God's servants. While they don't go out and fight on the battle lines, they show their strength through their faith and their courage. They don't accept their world as it is. They share their most precious gift so God can do incredible things through them. Why am I making such a big deal of these women? Well, partly because we rarely hear about them. And also, in part, I do it in memory of Neil Bakken. Neil was a member of Grace who passed away a couple years ago. He faithfully attended our Bible studies, and he'd faithfully share his profound irritation that the Bible was written by all men. He got so frustrated that we didn't hear more of the whole story, that we didn't hear about the women of the Bible, which I found kind of delightful coming from a man in his mid-80s. He'd point out how so many of us are people of faith because the women in our families, in our lives, have impacted us. Our mothers and grandmothers, wives and Sunday school teachers. Yet for much of history, women have been treated as second-class citizens and haven't had a voice in the faith. And that's shaped how the church has operated for 2,000 years. The way the Lutheran church has operated changed 50 years ago when women were finally allowed to become pastors in our denomination. These two were strong women of faith who had to make sacrifices to serve God. They were part of a movement that helped change the world and change the church for people like me, and maybe for people like you too. I met Pastor Eva in 1988 when she came to my church as an interim pastor when I was a kid. I had never met a female pastor before, and I'm not even sure I knew that was a possibility. Pastor Eva was kind and gracious, 
eloquent, worldly, and inspiring. She wasn't just a good female pastor. She was a great pastor. One of the best I've ever known. Seeing that God could work through the woman in front of me made me think that God might work through me, too. 2020 has been a tough year, but it's also been a year of celebration in the EOCA, celebrating 50 years of women being ordained, 40 years of black women being ordained, and 10 years of LGBTQ people being ordained in the ELCA. It's a year when we celebrate that God does great things through all sorts of people. It's a year when we celebrate that strength and faith come in all sorts of ways through many kinds of people. As we celebrate 50 years of women ordained, think about your history here at Grace and the wonderful females you've had here. Pastor Rachel, intern Kirsten, and intern Anne, and the other female pastors you may have known here or elsewhere. But also think beyond them. Remember the names of the strong women, the lay people who helped to shape your faith and to shape this congregation. Names like Dagmar, Ingeborg, Lillian, Eldred, Bernice, Bev, Eunice, Joy, Margaret, and the many other names of women who have been foundational in your faith life. God worked through each of these people to bring grace, love, and mercy to others. Hannah's story and the story of all of these women reminds us that God has worked through women in unique and powerful ways throughout history and will continue to do so. God works through all of us, men, women, and children, to bring God's love and to change the world in wonderful ways. And in that, we are all part of God's revolution of love.